biofuels is not linked necessarily to the price of oil. It's also linked to the price of its alternative uses, so the food crops, for instance. So say in the case of oil palm, why would a oil palm producer start producing biodiesel if he can get a higher price on the oil on the uh, CPO market, so the crude palm oil market? So, so the price of biofuels is also linked to the price of its food uses. So take in the case of biodiesel, for instance, it can be made from palm oil, it can be made from soy oil, it can be made from eutropha oil, for instance. So when a producer decides to start making biodiesel, it also needs to consider the market price for its alternative use. So for instance, palm oil. But at the moment, we're seeing that palm oil is at a very high level. It's about $1,000 per ton. So if we translate that to the current oil price, which is about $120 per barrel, then it's not economically viable for that producer to start producing biodiesel instead of palm oil. So in that respect, there's no real reason for those producers to shift to biofuels. And as a result, you may not see the spike in biofuel demand triggered by these oil prices, as some people might expect. The EU mandate will require that 10% of um, transportation energy will come from renewable sources. Um, so that means that as that is implemented, so that will happen over the next decades, and as its own demand for energy increases, you'll see a massive increase in biofuel demand, especially for, for transportation fuels uh, in the car sector, for instance, uh, over the next decade. So we're seeing projections made by various energy institutions which say that the demand for biofuels, particularly because of the EU and also the United States, will increase by, say, about two and a half times over the next nine to ten years. So that increase in demand is driven because of these regulations. It's not driven because oil marketing companies necessarily think it's the best option, it's the cheapest option to adopt biofuels. So in that way, you'll see an increasing demand for biofuels, which will ensure that the sector remains quite stable, that demand will stay quite stable. So in that respect, producers that only look at the biofuel market are not interested in the other markets they could expect a stable market and a stable return on investment over the coming years. Considering biofuel mandates in non-industrialized countries, we're not talking about the uh, United States or the European Union, you've seen a movement to adopt policies and strategies and even laws to look at how can they incorporate biofuels into the energy mix. Now, a lot of those mandates were received a lot of enthusiasm in the beginning because I think $150 a barrel, uh, we have to import most of this. This is becoming a huge train on our current accounts. So we should consider developing biofuels and we have the, the agroecological least suitable land in order to develop those feedstocks. There is enough land in a lot of countries. So it could potentially be a feasible um, alternative source of energy. But the moment that oil prices were coming down again and biofuels was no longer economically viable, then you saw a change of fate in the government because they started realizing these oil companies are not going to start blending if they're going to make a loss. So either we force them or we provide them incentives. And that's where the EU and, for instance, also Brazil and the United States have been quite strong in. They've developed a sector mostly through, for instance, excise tax exemptions, through various forms of subsidies. So it does show that in order to create a stable market and you create producers that are willing to supply consistently throughout the year, you're going to have to provide those incentives. And then you wonder, in, these, in a lot of these countries, in developing countries, there are huge opportunity costs associated with that funding. You could spend it on much different things, which could have much more developmental, which are more in line with developmental priorities than doing so. So, for instance, in Indonesia, you saw that it required another subsidy from the government over and beyond the current subsidy giving the fuels. So, blending biofuels then becomes a drain on the fiscal reserves rather than it's actually reducing uh, the deficits. So you saw a change of fate uh, in that respect, but presumably as oil prices increase, 
you might see a recovery again, and that's what we're seeing in Indonesia now, where the government is putting in more effort to try to blend, and, and there's more political commitment as oil prices come up again. So in Africa, the majority of countries are for 100% dependent on foreign sources of fossil fuels. So when the oil price increases dramatically, it has a huge macroeconomic impact on those countries. So on the one hand, uh, they'll have to import or they could import more, which will have an impact on the current accounts and potentially also on government debt. Or alternatively, uh, they have the option of contracting their national outputs uh, in order to compensate for higher prices. Uh, so neither of those uh, options are particularly desirable. So for those countries to shift to renewable energy sources in general uh, will have a huge benefit to enhancing macroeconomic stability, at least in terms of exposure to oil price shocks. Um, so it will make a lot of sense for those countries to start developing a domestic renewable energy sector where they would not need to import um, fuels or energy sources any longer. Now, there are various practical constraints to doing that, uh, the first of which is the need to provide incentives in order to jumpstart a domestic sector. Um, on the one hand, they're seeing investments right now, but those investors are not necessarily eager to supply the domestic market. They can get much higher returns exporting to subsidizing markets, such as the European Union, for instance. Uh, but supplying domestic market, there is no real incentive to doing that. Whether or not that will happen, again, depends very much on government policy and regulations. How effective are the environmental laws in order to protect forests from conversion to, for instance, feedstock monoculture. Um, a lot of those countries have proven that they may have regulations in place which could prevent against that, but the issue is mostly implementation, uh, implementation and enforcement. And that is typically quite weak in a lot of countries. So there is a risk that a lot of investment in huge areas of land, in areas which are suitable towards cultivating that, which are a lot of the time forested land or prime agricultural land, that will have a lot of implications for livelihoods, for people who depend on the forest, or people who depend on cropland that was formerly there, and obviously on the carbon stock also. Um, again, internationally we have regulations that try to prevent that. So the European Union, for instance, has imposed this renewable energy directive, which requires that it reduces a certain amount of greenhouse gas emissions vis-a-vis -vis, um, the fossil fuel sector, for instance. Now, that will regulate trades. So if those markets are producing for the European market, they'll have to meet those uh, criteria. However, for the domestic market, those conditions are not in place. So arguably, it would be the domestic market, provided it is large enough, so in the case of Indonesia, it's quite a large domestic market, which could drive substantial land use change in order to meet domestic demand. But in Africa, their fuel consumption is, or in a lot of countries, is comparatively low. So blending, say, with blending 10% of fossil fuels with biofuels need not require that much land. And I think there are examples where, in, in uh, for instance, take like Zambia or, or Mozambique, for instance, or even Zimbabwe, where you can have a single plantation, 15 to 20,000 hectares, which could meet that 10% blend. So it doesn't necessarily need all that much land. The problem is, or the issue more is, is how do you allocate that land? And that becomes an issue of regulations and governance once again.